This is the tenth study in the book of Genesis conducted by Chuck Missler. The subject of this tape, Genesis 9, verse 20 through chapter 11. Heavenly Father, we just praise you from the bottom of our heart for this opportunity to explore your book. We thank you, Father, for this evening and this opportunity. We would ask, Father, in accordance with the promises you've given us, to just open our hearts and our understanding by your Holy Spirit to your word, that we might understand those things which were written aforetime for our learning, and that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope, and that in all these things we would become more aware that the volume of the book is written of Jesus Christ. And Father, as we explore these passages, we just ask that you would be with us. Give us an appetite and a hunger for those things that are fruitful and edify. And help us, Father, not to get off in tangents in areas that are not productive. For Father, we would just seek you as our teacher through your Holy Spirit that was promised by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we're uh, finishing, hopefully, uh, close to finishing, uh, the most difficult third, if you will, of the book of Genesis. Chapters 1 through 11 are the story of mankind at large. We started with the creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, the fall of Adam, the whole development of the antediluvian or pre-flood civilization, and uh, the deliverance of Noah and his own. And we have a an interesting discussion of the post-flood civilization tonight. And we should get uh, into the table of nations, as it's called, Genesis 10. All of this sets the stage for the next major section of the book of Genesis, the call of Abraham, chapter 12 on. And in general, most people regard the book of Genesis as three three major parts. The story prior to Abraham, which we're concluding tonight. The story of Abraham himself, which is pivotal in the scripture. In fact, some of the most exciting prophecy passages are in the, in the study, in, incident to and involved with the father of the faithful, Abraham. And uh, generally, most people regard the story of Joseph, while it's one of the 12 tribes, when we get to the story of Joseph, we have an extended narrative that, it frankly fascinates me, has not been made into a Hollywood movie, because the, uh, the, the, in their interest in scripts and so forth, there have been many biblical passages uh, rendered into very exciting movies. But uh, the one that, fat, to the best of my knowledge, has been missed in terms of just sheer drama and emotion, and um, so forth, is the story of Joseph. And so we'll take that sort of as a third of three-thirds, not necessarily an equal size. But um, but tonight we are um, into the, uh, the uh, conclusion, in a sense, of the story of Noah. There's no way we can exhaust the flood. We could have spent many, many, much, much time on that. But... Um, I think we're probably, many of you may feel we're taking long enough as it is. Um, we did, I think, last time um, cover how, let's see, we came down, I think we came through chapter 8, discussed uh, the, the institution of human government. I believe we covered that last time, right? And um, thank you. And we got up to about verse 19 through 19 of uh, chapter 9. And... Um, And again, as I looked through my notes and, and reviewed the material last time, a long list of things occurred to me that we didn't cover, but uh, I have a feeling of we, we uh, well, our whole, whole intent anyway. I'll, I'll, draw, I'll, I'll uh, take refuge in, 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 in my definition of salt. He instructs us to be uh, the salt of the earth. And uh, the casual use of salt is, of course, to make you thirsty. Right? So I'll leave that, and if you if you find uh, uh, 
those things are intriguing. You'll, you'll dig in on your own from the bibliography that we had passed out, and I'll have some additional copies of that in future evenings uh, and uh, let you explore the book on your own. Um, we did cover the uh, the rainbow. The uh, rainbow is covered uh, three times in the scripture, but in each case it's associated with the throne of God. We see it here, of course, in Genesis as a sign, a token, symbol, commitment of the Lord uh, relative to uh, flooding the earth with water. And uh, we have uh, uh, the, the same image occurs again, or I should say the, the rainbow occurs again in Ezekiel and also in the book of Revelation, uh, incident to the throne of God. So if you're, in, if you're into rainbows, you can uh, study rainbows in the scripture. Okay, so we got up to verse 9. Now, the interesting thing about this flood is that the flood destroyed sinful man. All but eight were wiped out on the entire earth. One other point that I think is important for us to recognize is the language of the book of Genesis clearly requires clearly requires a uh, universal flood. Because if the flood was local or partial or some, uh, some scholars like to retreat to, then uh, the Lord has broken his co covenant. Because his covenant in chapter 9 was never again to bring a flood like that one. Well, there have been many, many widespread, devastating floods. And if the flood at issue here was something less than a universal worldwide flood, then, then we've got a problem. And I mention that as sort of a backhanded evidence that uh, scripture, um, that the scripture uh, really uh, speaks of a, a universal flood. But the interesting thing is that the flood did not wipe out sin. The flood wiped out sinful men. And what's amazing here, the very first event in the new world, here we are, as Noah and his family have, have uh, the ark is at rest and they've come off the ark and indeed the first thing he did was to build an altar. And, uh, and uh, we, we took note of that last time. But chapter 9 doesn't close before we have a very pathetic, dismal, disheartening um, glimpse into the heart of man. Um, as we'll sense here that we don't have a full insight as to what probably was going on, although what insight we have makes it a bit disparaging, uh, discouraging. Um, Okay, let's uh, verse 20. We're down at chapter 9, verse 20. And Noah began to be a farmer or husbandman or anyway, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now, this may strike us as strange for a lot of reasons. First of all, the idea of the father lying naked as a result of his drunkenness probably doesn't offend us as much as the import of the text implies it should. Um, and many scholars are very divided about just exactly what's at issue here. Certainly, as a minimum, the issue here is one of a lack of respect for the father, and one gets the impression from the the handling of this whole situation um, that uh, uh, the respect that should have been shown is, is, is a very, very high thing. There may be even more here than meets the eye because the verb in the Hebrew where it says he was uncovered, we in the English speak of that, think of that in the passive voice that he was uncovered as describing his condition. The Hebrew structure implies an active verb. That was something that was done to him. Furthermore, as we skip down here, 
in verse 24, moving on, and let's, let's, let's finish the chapter and then come back. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, he, and, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And then Noah lived after the flood some 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, several strange things about this. This whole business of Noah getting drunk is doesn't sound to us like that grave a, a cir circumstance. And that can meet, that can speak to do diff two different things. It can speak to the the level of, of depravity that we're in, where we don't regard that as that serious. Um, but it also can hint here as to some other things that are going on. The fact that there was an active act involved, the fact that in several verses, both in verse 21 and in 24, there's in the language implied an act. Many scholars, not all, it's a lot of controversy about it, many scholars believe that what was involved here was a homosexual act on the part of one of the sons, on the part of him. And um, that's hinted at in the text. It's far from conclusive, but it is a hint and a suggestion that uh, you, that is in the literature and many scholars uh, uh, defend, and so I share that with you. There is a, a, a sort of a disturbing thing here, setting aside, first of all, the act of Ham, whatever that was, and that is the situation with Noah. You know, Noah should be a, a, uh, a lesson to us, all of us, for watchfulness and prayer. I want you to think about Noah for a minute. For 600 years, Noah walked with God. For 600 years, Noah walked with God. God uh, uh, established his, his uh, uh, salvation for Noah and his family, and indeed for the whole human race, and in fact preserved the messianic line through Noah. Now, indeed, it was through grace, not through anything Noah earned. I don't mean to imply that Noah was a good guy in the sense that he earned that. We went through that before. But certainly, one could argue that 600 years certainly led to his being a vessel or a vehicle of deliverance. What's also interesting is that, okay, after, the, after this incredible event um, of the, the, the 371 days in the ark and leaving the ark and starting the new world, it's surprising that he fell um, into the circumstance. And furthermore, what's interesting is of the 300 years following, we have no record. Isn't that interesting? Noah has no witness after this act. The last event in Noah's life we have is this rather discouraging scene recorded in chapter 9. The last 300 years or so, or 350 years of Noah are a blank, in effect. And uh, I think that's sobering. Um it's also kind of interesting, as just an observation here, is that Noah lived 950 years. We're going to discover that people after the flood live shorter lives. This long life associated with Noah and Methuselah and the rest of these guys, pre-flood, the antediluvian people, uh, was a pre-flood association. And the canopy theory is widely held by biblical scholars is that there was an absence of radiation, what have you, other circumstances that led to this long longevity. And it's interesting that the shorter longevity didn't start immediately after flood. Noah himself was apparently um, not significantly affected by the post-flood conditions because he lived, lived 350 years later. In fact, now I should also mention the genealogies in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 are very, very controversial. There are many good scholars that believe that those genealogies are not tight genealogies. That is, they're not exclusive father, son, father, son, father, son, genealogies. It turns out, in the ancient languages, particularly Hebrew, there isn't really a word for grandson. If you're, you are the son of your great-grandfather, as far as the linguistics are concerned. 
And so, when you say someone, like if you use Matthew's genealogy, or so-and-so begot someone, that generally implies direct succession. doesn't have to, but it generally does. But just being the son of somebody could... There are cases, and I think we've alluded to those in the past, uh, when we, in the Zechariah study it came up, where someone is regarded as the son of his grandfather, where his grandfather was, not, was a notable priest and, and he was a priest. There was a father in between that sort of goes without a lot of comment. Um, the point is, there's a big controversy as to whether the genealogies in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 are tight or not. If they're tight, then we can use them for some chronology and some dating studies. If they're not tight, they raise all kinds of other questions. And there are good scholars on both sides of that question. There are many, many scholars that are very conservative in their biblical viewpoint that still feel that there are gaps in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. I personally have waded through a lot of literature on the subject, and uh, I, st- I also, let me point, finish the sentence, there are also many conservative, sound, profound scholars that believe the gene- genealogies are tight. And in the absence of an abundance of information to the contrary, I would lean to a tight genealogy for a lot of reasons. But the, the subject is not crisp, clear, unequivocally arguable, and I don't think, I think it would get into a very dry technical, laborious study to get into that and try to show you both sides because it hangs on very heavy technicalities. Um, so I'm personally regarding them as tight, but I think it's fair to point out that um, there are many scholars that don't believe they are. If they are tight genealogies, then there's some very interesting things. Noah lived until Abraham was 58 years old. And that's interesting. Shem, Noah's son, lived 502 years after the flood, and that means he lived till after Terah, Abraham's father, died. So Abraham's father very reasonably could have uh, had a dialogue with Shem. In fact, uh, even Noah could have lived until Terah was 128 years old depends on how some of those dovetail. And we tend to think of thousands of years, because we have this whole conditioning of, of the ge- geologists and things, that there are thousands of years intervening here. Not really. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. But let's get in, getting back to this business here. We now we have this rather unsavory circumstance um, between um, Ham. And, and it's interesting that the writer here, being Moses, emphasizes Canaan here. Ham had other sons, and we're going to get into that. But the son that is conspicuous of, conspicuously of interest is Canaan. And another thing that really confuses the scholars, and here again, we don't have a lot to go on, is why Canaan, the son of Ham, was cursed for what apparently Ham did. That's a heavy trip, because you can get into uh, volumes on this subject. Um, many people try to make the curse on Ham somehow relate to black peoples, and that's naive. We're going to see that when we get to the table of na- nations. That is not at all what's here. That's not at all what the scripture lays on us. Uh, it is something you run into in, 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 uh, in uh, incompetent literature of the past. But um, the curse here, incidentally, isn't on Ham. Strangely enough, the curse is on Canaan. Now, some scholars believe that curse is on Canaan generically. also includes the other sons of Ham. And uh, others feel it's specifically Canaan, that it's in the son of Ham that the curse is laid. Um, Others uh, ascribe the curse on Canaan as simply a prophecy, not necessarily accruing because of Ham's sin. Follow me? We're going to run into that in Genesis 49, where where uh, Jacob pronounces a prophecy on each of the 12 sons. And some of them are really quite cryptic, and we'll we'll have a delightful time going through that when we get to Genesis 49, because indeed some of it is very graphic and and really quite uh, fascinating. But again, it's a prophecy, not a curse. And this idea here of, uh, uh, of what's going on here, we tend to read it as a consequence of the sin, but that's a little tough because it's the son of the sinner that's being cursed. And another view that the scholars have is that the curse that's being pronounced here is simply a prophecy that Canaan is going to be cursed. And we're going to see why. Canaan's going to to do his thing in the sense of of the kinds of things he leads to. 
because he's going to have, a, you know, a guy by the name of Nimrod and all of that, or, and, and so forth. And we're going, or rather, we're going to have a, Canaan's going to end up. Excuse me, Canaan's going to be the uh, servant of service. They are going to serve uh, um, Shem. Let's go through a little more cautiously, verses 24 through 29. And Noah woke from his wine, knew, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. That's the verse that gives rise to uh, 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 scholars believing that there was something more than just uh, the fact that he was uh, uh, uncovered. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. By the way, it's the first, this is the first place that the word servant appears in the scripture. And if you're a student of the book of Revelation, you know that the first mention is usually considered a significant thing in the scripture. If you have a mystical view of the scripture, the place that a word first occurs is often very, very suggestive. Um, um, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And that's exactly what we're going to find from Canaan. We're going to find that, in fact, they are in servitude under Israel. Um, let me just skim ahead here a little bit. Uh, in Joshua chapter 9, verse 27, the Gibeonites make their deal and, as a result, are, are in servitude. In Judges chapter 1, verse 28, and all the way as recently as Solomon in 1 Kings 9, 20, 21, and so on, we have the Canaanites being in, in subjugation under Israel. And so most scholars would see, would see that as fulfilled in that, particular, uh, uh, in that particular sense. We'll get into Canaan. We'll get, when we get into Genesis 10, we'll get into the Canaanites more thoroughly. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now here's where Shem, that's why this passage may not necessarily be a response to the foregoing. It's an occasion where Noah prophesies on his sons. And he speaks of, of his grandson, really, Canaan, son of Ham. Now he speaks of Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. It's interesting that Shem is identified here then as the channel through which God will be honored. He is, of course, the channel through which the Messianic line flows. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. And that's the three passages, just to, a sampling I gave you, speaks of Canaan being the servant of Shem. Okay. God shall enlarge Japheth. Now that's a pun, incidentally. That's a pun. We had some people at the Arrowhead Conference uh, fascinated that there are puns in the Bible. The Bible is full of puns. Not necessarily humorous puns, just plays on words. Uh, the Lord being called a, you know, Nazar a Nazarene and a branch. The Lord being called the Lamb of God, in effect, is a pun in the sense of a double use of the word. Here we have, in effect, a pun because the word Japheth means to enlarge. That's what the word itself means. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. He shall tabernacle in the, in, 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 with Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. Canaan comes off poorly here. Okay? Because he's serving everybody. And on the one hand, that is interesting to, tr to track the, 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 the Canaanite families. But it's also been a, sub a, a passage of much abuse because much of the defense of slavery in the earlier history of our country was based on the notion that the uh, the black peoples were descendants of uh, of uh, Canaan and uh, were based on this. And that turns out, as we'll get into, to be a little naive. Um, anyway, then we get in this interesting comment. Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. To me, that's the most dismal part of the passage. I, I, it is a little discomforting to read about the strange incident that occurs earlier. Uh, but it's also disturbing that here a guy that has had those experiences um, uh, you know, for 300 years has nothing else to report. I think that's interesting. Okay, now, now we're going to get into uh, chapter 10. And chapter 10 is an interesting chapter. It's a, it, you might label chapter 10 the table of nations. It is called that by many Bible scholars. As we go through other passages of prophecy, all through, from, from 
uh, the scripture. We will constantly have reference to Genesis chapter 10 because it's the table of nations. We're going to have the genealogies of, um, of Noah here. And now these are the generations, the Toledah of the sons of Noah. And there's a very interesting thing. We have, we'll discover there are 70 families listed here. And what makes that interesting, when we get to Genesis chapter 46, we'll discover that the same number of families as there were children of Israel that entered into Egypt from Canaan. And we're going to discover in Deuteronomy that that probably was not an accident. The Lord appointed the boundary. And we'll get back to that as sort of a conclusion thing before we're all all finished. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to do before we leave chapter 9. You know, it's interesting um, to keep our antennas tuned to parallels. And uh, not to make a big thing of it, but just as sort of an exercise. If we had a class uh, and I was going to assign you homework, I would list uh, suggest that between now and next Monday night that you find ten ways that Noah and Adam were alike or had a, were in a parallel situation. Now, since I'm not going to be here next Monday night, it would be, un be unfair not to be able to grade the papers, so I'll give you a clue as to what some of the things you'd obviously have put on your papers if I gave you that assignment. Uh, of those ten things, the first thing you might observe that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 12, Adam followed the Adam was on the earth after the earth emerged from the waters. And we find that Noah was on the earth, obviously, after the earth emerged from the waters. We also learn from Genesis, uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 28, that Adam was appointed the Lord of creation. It was, it was given to him to, to run it. And, of course, in Noah, chapter 9, verse 2, he was given to, to him was delivered all things. To Adam, he was instructed, again, in Genesis chapter 1, that he was instructed to be, that he was blessed and he was to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And that was the same instruction that was given to Noah in chapter 9, verse 1. So in that sense, they're, very, they're in very parallel situations, isn't it? They're parallel in some other ways, too. Adam was placed in a garden to dress and keep it, and Noah became a farmer, a husbandman, planted a vineyard. It's interesting, they both blew it when they, under, they, they partook of some fruit. Is that interesting? That was a little way out, huh? Okay. Uh, now the word will get around town that uh, Chuck Missler says you shouldn't eat fruit, right? No. Um, but it's interesting because um, it was indeed in a garden that Adam transgressed and fell by partaking of fruit. And Noah, it was a product of the vineyard that caused him to be, uh, to, to, that occasioned his, his problem. Sin in both cases exposed their nakedness. Adam in chapter 3, verse 7, and Noah in chapter 9, verse 21. In both cases, they were covered by another. Obviously, in a different sense altogether, but just as an observation. And in Adam's case, there was a terrible curse pronounced on his posterity. Uh, posterity. They, they were, um, uh, that's mentioned in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And of course, um, with Noah too, you'll find that same thing developed in, in Genesis 24, among other places. It's also something else that's interesting. Adam had three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. And it was in the third son that the Messianic line was established. Noah has three sons, and in the order that they're named, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, it's in Shem's line that the Messianic line is established. And, of course, in each case, their fall is the occasion of a major prophecy. In Adam's case, of course, the prophecy of redemption in chapter 3, verse 15. And in Noah's case, here we have a prophecy concerning uh, the destiny of his three sons. And we'll understand the destiny of his three sons better when we see who their offspring are and what comes out of that. I don't know if that's a big deal, but that's something that I thought I should share with you as just a, an exercise, and it's the kind of thing that it's sometimes very fruitful to be, to be alert to. Um, some other parallels you, can, parallels you can draw is, as you go further here, Ham's primary sin was not to honor his father. Setting aside this homosexual issue one way or the other, the main issue, even if you have a more conservative view of the thing, clearly Ham's sin 
the issue here is one of honoring his father. And that was Adam's problem, too. Um, okay. Now let's see what we can make of chapter 10. And chapter 10 is almost an irresistible chapter to bore you to tears with long lists of where all these tribes went and who they became. And that, of course, has seven versions because each different ancient historian has a slightly different twist on them. And, and it can get on and on and on. So what I'm really going to try to do tonight is give you the highlights on the presumption that those of you that aren't that interested will be greatly relieved by that treatment. And those of you that are really interested can dig into the dusty shelves of a good library and become an expert on just who these people are. And uh, so, chapter 10, Table of Nations, verse 1. Now, these are the Toledoth, the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, see, in this case, the order is the other way around. The most important first. We know that um, the younger son was Ham, right? And yet Ham's in the middle. So it's Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It's a different order. And you might always be sensitive to that, by the way. As we go through Genesis, you're going to discover that the order of the of different things is, is never casual, you, especially the 12 tribes. They're always listed in a different order, and each time it's for a reason. Um, anyway, unto, the, unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Yavan and Tubal and Meshech and Tyrus. The sons of Japheth, first of all, is that group of, of, of uh, tribes that you and I, in general, will probably easily relate to because they are really what we think of the, you know, the Indo-European nations. And um, Gomer is tracked by most of the authors as the forebearer of the, of the Sumerians, which became later the uh, Indo-European tribes. And we're going to discover here shortly... We're going to get to Gomer's sons. Yeah, okay, in verse 3. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ripheth, and Tugarma are his three sons. Now, the Ashkenazi were, are there some controversy about this, but most, it, it generally is regarded as the ancient, the, the predecessors to the Germans. And the, in the Hebrew traditions, that's a, that, that concept is especially strong as the, uh, the uh, German Jews were referred to as the Ashkenazi. But the Ashkenaz apparently is the, the ancient Germanic peoples. Now, Ripoth is one of those that we don't really know a lot about. It turns out that Ripoth, though, in one reckoning, a corruption of that word is the word that some scholars believe the word Europe came from. Interesting, just a linguistic thing. That's not obvious from the English, but it's a, it's a, it's a etymological study that's kind of interesting. Tagarma is um, the name that even today that the Armenians refer to themselves. They refer to themselves as the house of Tagarma. The only controversy about that is that the, the Tagarma, as it occurs in scripture, may be broader. The Armenians may be only one group, one subset of the house of Tagarma. But they, the fact that they attract themselves to the house of Tagarma is uh, visible even to this day. Um, okay, uh, let's just go down the, the, the root thing here uh, where it gives the, the, the genealogy of the sons. The next one we have the sons of Yavon, or Javan. Yavan is the Ionians or the Greeks. It's interesting that the Greeks regard themselves as the sons of Iapetos, I-A-P-E-T-O-S, if you want to write it out in, in, in our alphabet, which is another name for Japheth. And his son being Yavin, or Ioni, uh, Yavin, uh, being the forebear of the Greeks, even in their culture today. Um, so the uh, Yavin, you'll find uh, links to the Greeks. Elisha is, um, this is a different Elisha than you're thinking of in terms of the Hebrew name, but uh, Elisha is um, a, a, corrupt, a corruption of that, or an etymological derivation of that, becomes Hellas, or the word from which we get Hellenic. It's linked to that, believe it or not. Now, Tarshish is a tough one. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in trying to establish where Tarshish really was. In the, it occurs all through the Bible, and it's always a place a long way away. And it's, uh, um, 
In Isaiah 66, verse 19, and Psalm 72.10 are a couple of examples, but there are many in which we're fascinated to find out what Tarshish is really all about. Uh, many scholars associate Tarshish with one of the islands in the, in the Mediterranean, relatively nearby. Some scholars that are a little more venturesome feel that it might have been Spain or, or you know, a settlement in Spain. All we really know from Ezekiel 27, there's a passage which causes us to believe that Tarshish was a source of silver, iron, tin, and lead. Now, we do know that Tarshish was only available by sea. We know that from the book of Jonah. Remember Jonah, to flee his ministry that God had called him to, is, took a ship, to, the ship that had all the problems with the big fish and all that, was on its way to Tarshish, wherever that was. And also Solomon has a, boasted of a fleet of ships that were, were to Tarshish, uh, 1 Kings 10, 22. Now, students of the details of those stories also include, even, even the Solomon, Solomonic fleet was a smelting fleet. Tarshish is clearly a source of tin. Now that track, so the main clues as to where Tarshish is hangs on the idea of it being a source of tin. And several of the places that are closer in are possible sources of tin. But some scholars, not a large number, but there are some scholars that attribute Tarshish to uh, the British Isles. Britannia was named Britannia as it was, its na it, it name derives from its early source of tin at a time when that was very, very valuable. Or still is. I don't mean to imply it isn't, but I mean when that was well, that was its major stock and trade. Now, incidentally, as just an, another aside, that may seem very strange to us as just uh, students of uh, early history, but um, those of you that are students of Stonehenge know that at the time of Stonehenge, the archaeological evidence there indicates that at the time of Stonehenge, which was... Uh, about 1500 B.C., they and the peoples there enjoyed worldwide trade. There are artifacts from the Middle East and from India and elsewhere at Stonehenge. One of the great mysteries of Stonehenge is the, is the cultural opportunity it provided for... for uh, it was apparently a very well-known temple, and uh, uh, it make, there are references to it in the ancient, uh, in ancient literature. So the possi one possibility, by no means a conclusively provable thing, is that Tarshish was a, uh, a, a label for a culture in the British Isles as a source of tin, as one that was available only by an extended sea voyage, and it would fit uh, what we do know about Tarshish, but it's by no means conclusively um, ascertainable. Okay. Um, and, then, uh, and then we've got the Kittim and the Dunham, and I'm not sure I've got all of these laid out here, uh, but I skipped over a few that I'm sure of was great interest to you because that's the detailed. We, we're, we're, we're shortly getting to the sons of Ham. Before we leave uh, the sons of Japheth, we mentioned a couple of others. There's one by the name of Magog, and I assume some of you have heard of Magog. You know, people who have absolutely no interest in the book of Genesis chapter 10 uh, are fascinated to find out who Magog is, and that, of course, accrues because of the fascinating references in Ezekiel 38 and 39. By no means the only place that Magog appears in the scripture. Um, and I might mention that a Babylonian king writing to an Egyptian pharaoh, and I've forgotten the year, but very, very early record, makes reference to Magog and in such a way that he dwells north of the Black Sea, which is kind of interesting. Magog is regarded by most scholars as the ancestor from which the Scythians came, which are the, the forebears of the, 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 uh, the Russians, or at least uh, some of the tribes that make up what we think of as the Soviet Union. Now, also associated with Magog, we have a couple of other names, Tubal and Meshech. Now, Meshech is uh, linked to the Muscovy, which is, which is a word that is indigenous to Russia, and that linguistic root is pretty clear. Tubal links to Tobolsk. It's the Tiberians of Herodotus or the Tabalians of the Assyrian documents. And again, both the Meshek and the Tubal references are regarded as the Muski by Saragon II. He was the great conqueror of the Assyrian Empire. Even in the Ezekiel passage, this group, Magog, Meshek, Tubal, are their chief is spoken of as the chief of Rosh, and the word Rosh there is the word from is the same 
um, linguistic root from which the word Russia derives her name. So uh, Meshek, Tubal, and Magog are linked uh, 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 tribally to the area that we think of as the Soviet Union. Now, the Medai are clearly the Medes, dwelt west of the Caspian Sea. They uh, appear as early as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a group uh, actively uh, in history, 900 B.C., and of course at 700 B.C. or so become the beginnings of, a Persian, of the Medo-Persian Empire and become very prominent in uh, the Book of Daniel and so forth. Um, one of the, Tyrus is mentioned here in verse 2. Tyrus is associated with the Etruscans of early Italy. In, in several ways, for what that's worth. Um, so as we think of Japheth, we think of him as um, the uh, Euro- Indo-European nations. But it gets more interesting as we go. Let's keep moving here. And by these were the borders of the nations divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. And now the sons of Ham. We have Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan, four sons. Now, Ham is uh, of, of substantial interest to M- Moses' readers because of, and to us too, but uh, especially them because of the, the, the effects of the, uh, the Canaanites that are going to be very prominent here. Um, let's, uh, let's take the, uh, oh, by the way, I might mention the word Cush is um, translated Ethiopia in many of your uh, uh, English translations, but actually consists of um, two real tribal roots, Ethiopians, Ethiopia to the south and the Kassites east of the, east of the, uh, the Assyrians. Um, uh, Seba and Havala and Sabta and Rama and Sabteka and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan. Now, Sheba and Dedan are great of great interest to us. Sheba... The Sheba, the earlier one, tr- links to the Sudan. The Sheba and Dedan, both, and also Havilah, are what we would know as Arabia. You can find reference to Dedan in Isaiah 21:13, and Havilah in 1 Samuel 15, verse 7. But those are, uh, for our purposes, uh, uh, adequately defined as, essentially, in that geography or you know ethnic background, that we associate with Arabia. Now, a very important one to be sensitive to is Mizraim. That's a word that that uh, you may not be sensitive to, but as you go through the scripture, you'll find it occur a surprising number of times, and it is a synonym for Egypt. Egypt. Uh, you'll find it in uh, Genesis um, 10, 6, of course, and then uh, Psalm uh, 78, 51, and elsewhere. There's an interesting thing about the word Mizraim, and that is that it's a plural ending. It's a dual ending. And it refers to the upper and lower Egypt, which uh, were like two different lands that were united, of course, subsequently. But uh, uh, Mizraim is uh, is Egypt. Okay, and put, sometimes spelled P H U T, sometimes P U T, is sometimes translated Libya, but that's again an oversimplification. Uh, Cush and put are often Ethiopia and Libya, but that's a very very uh, that that's an oversimplification that you may find in some. Bible footnotes. Um, now we're going to get into some more of these guys down here under Canaan. Um, but we have a little uh, interesting parenthetical issue in here that uh, we'll take on a little bit more in depth when we get to chapter 11, but let's make note of it right here. Verse 8, And Cush begot Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. In other words, as a proverb, as a byword. Now, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erek and Akkad and Kalda in the land of Shinar. He's a number of cities that he founded. Now, this guy Nimrod is going to... uh, uh, be a subject of a lot more discussion and what I think I'd like to do is leave him for the moment and come back to him. Let's get through the rest of this. uh... Chapter 11 will predate some of this and so we'll get into this a little bit more in chapter 11. Let's wade through some more of these genealogies and then come back to the plot that 
unravels here. Chapter of uh, verse 11 of chapter 10. Out of that land went forth Ashur, and he's the guy that the founder of the Assyrian Empire, and builded uh, Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth and Kala. And um, the same is a great city. And Mizraim begot Ludim and Ananim and Lehabim and and I don't know much about these, other than to point out that all of them are plural names, so they're family names, not necessarily they're, they're peoples. You notice each one has the, 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 the Hebrew I am ending, which is a plural ending. And out of whom came the Philistines. So the Philistines have, an, in effect, an Egyptian background. The, the, the Philistines are, as we, will, as we encounter at great uh, length in uh, the time of the Judges and onward, are really e Egyptian in their origins, uh, in that they are sons of uh, Misraim. Verse 15, And Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Aravadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of Canaan, Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanite Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest unto Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and unto Adma and Zeboim, and even unto Elisha. Now, the, the Canaanites are, of course, great interest to us because that's the, the these are the tribes. These are the uh, seven nations. Seven of these are the prominent nations at the time that Joshua conquers the land. And um, I might mention a couple of them here. Sidon is familiar to us because Sidon was the forebear of the, what we know as the Phoenicians that great maritime nation headquartered out of Sidon and Tyre and so forth. The city of Tyre comes a little later. Heth is the father of the Hittites. And we'll see them in Genesis 23.10. And uh, they, they become a very significant people from the time of Abraham all the way through to Solomon. In fact, for 800 years, they have a major empire. The Hittite empire is a subject of great interest to archaeologists. Now, one linguistic variation on their name happens to be the Kite, K-H-I-T-T-A-E, from which the word cafe comes from. And there are some uh, students of, of the sort of thing that track the Hittites towards cafe. We're going to come to verse 17. In, in verse 17, verse, yeah, in verse 17, you'll catch another, the Sinite. And there's much we could spend an evening on the various places that word and its der derivations come. The word sin, strangely enough, even tracks back to a ling linguistically, that is, to one of those name variations. But the Sinites also become the Sinim of Isaiah 49.12 and also go to the Far East. And it's fact, it's to that word that we speak of when we speak. Oh, you'll often hear of the, of the China, Chinese Speak, sp uh, uh, speaking of the, the Sino-Soviet bloc or the Sino-Japanese war, the word Sino is linguistically still an allusion to chi China. And that comes from the Sinites. So both from the Sinites and the, ha and, the, and the Hittites, we have what are regarded as the roots of the of what we know uh, as the Oriental uh, uh, tribes, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, Okay, let's move on. Verse 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. And unto Shem. Now we're taking the third group. So we've gone through three sons. Japheth, Ham, and now Shem. Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Ar. Arpachshad, and Lud, and Aram. And um, the most important of these is going to be one we get down in verse 25, e uh, Eber. But before we do that, let's see. Um, uh, Aram becomes the uh, Arameans, and one of the key variations of Hebrew, if you will, is Aramaic, which tra tracks to Aram. And he has, uh, his children are Uz, Hul, Gither and Mash. Uz is interesting to us, if for no other reason than it's the homeland of Job, as mentioned in Job 1 1. And also, you get a reference to it in Jeremiah 25 20. 
And Abraham said, begot Shelah, and Shelah begot Eber. Now, Eber is very important because Eber is the word, is the name from which the name Hebrew derives. The son of Eber, or Hebrew. It also, the word means to pass over. So it's also those that crossed over the river. You'll hear it both ways. But it's just a, as, a, as an interesting background item. And Joktan, now that there, uh, no. This is also where we get this fascinating verse in verse 25. Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now that little backhanded reference has caused libraries to fill with shelves of scholars who try to figure out what that really meant. There are those that believe, there's two, there's two views of this. There's one that's very mysterious and kind of interesting, but probably wrong. And then there's one that's probably more practical, but not nearly as much fun. The interesting, <laughs> the interesting view of Peleg, and it may be valid, is that it was in this period that the earth was divided, the continental drift and all of that. Uh, there's a lot, you know, there's, you've probably read books and, or come across this idea of how the continents of the world fit together and have drifted apart. The whole concept of continental drift is a subject of great interest to people to students of the earth. And um, uh, there are those that, that ascribe the, the, the dividing of the earth in that sense to this interesting little verse in Genesis uh, chapter 10. For it was in his days, that is the days of Peleg, whose name, by the way, means division, um, that the earth was divided. And with that little backhanded reference, the writer moves on. Now there's another view. There's another view. And that is that... Um, that uh, uh, Peleg uh, may have been named as as an, a sequence in Shem's line of the event that we're going to read about in chapter 11, with the nation the nations being divided by the tongues at Babel. Now this gets into some chronological questions. There are those that try to make a case that the naming of Peleg uh, by Eber was a tribute to the event that occurred in Babel. The presumption is that Shem and his line were not subject to some of the chaos and confusion that occurs in chapter 11. Uh, others feel that that doesn't fit chronologically and they feel there's something far more heavy in verse 25. And frankly, we don't know. that You can, you can waste a lot of time wading through people's specu you know, scholarly speculations, so I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that here tonight. Anyway, the two, Peleg and Joktan, and Joktan has a number of sons listed here that I'll, rather than just butcher up the pronunciation, you can go through. When you get down to verse 29, you find Ophir and Havilah. Ophir is mentioned frequently because as a source of gold. They speak all through the scriptures, the, the gold of Ophir. And, and uh, Jobab. Now, Jobab, by the way, it's interesting. Some, many, some scholars ascribe this Jobab in verse 29 as the Job of the book of Job. Most scholars, as you may know, feel that the book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible, even older than the five books of Moses. And uh, the Jobab here in Genesis uh, chapter 10, verse 29, is some, by some scholars ascribed to, you know, as, as being Job. It's not obvious from the passage, and it gets into a whole linguistic study that, that uh, uh, you can get into if you're interested, but uh, it's just a comment. And all these are the sons of Joktan. Their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest from Sephar, uh, a mount of the east, and these are the sons of Shem after their families and their tongues and their lands and their nations. All these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Okay, now we get into this very, very interesting um, passage for the next, the first nine verses of chapter 11. And um, I guess the easiest way is just to jump in. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, by the way, for it, I think it was almost universally regarded by scholars for centuries, for lots of good reasons, that that one language and that one speech was what? Hebrew. There are some scholars that uh, more current years feel it may, that maybe uh, it was just a derivative of, of a more original language, but there's an awful lot of evidence that says that Hebrew was the original language. First of all, all the place names and a lot of the early records make sense in the Hebrew in terms of that. And also there's a passage in Zephaniah that describes a return to Hebrew in the uh, millennium. Zephaniah 3.9. We'll, we'll look at that before the evening's over, I believe, unless I get distracted on some of these by-roads. Um, 
In any case, the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Now, this is an interesting verse. And it's, it's, uh, it, has, it has great significance to archaeologists because in that area there is a shortage of stone. You wouldn't think that stone is something that's in short supply, but it turns out that this is uh, the idea of making brick. Not the way they did in Egypt, where they just made bricks and sun-dried them. These are baked bricks, okay? Burned them thoroughly, see? It speaks of a building technology that's indigenous to the area and has been confirmed by the the uh, by by uh, archaeological excavations. It's a very very interesting issue that isn't obvious to to. Uh, 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 oh, also the slime is the term. It's really bitumen or asphalt, and this peculiar construction of burning the brick to really make stones out of them, and uh, and to uh, cement them with uh, asphalt is this construction that they find in the in that region of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, archaeological digs. Anyway, they said, Come, let us build us a city and a tower whose top, you have the word may reach, maybe in your King James, unto heaven. It's a tower unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, um, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be withheld from them and that they have imagined to do. Come, let us, interesting word, us, plural, uh, go down, and, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there upon the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from there did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And that's all you got. That's this famous story of the Tower of Babel, and you wonder what on earth is going on. And what you need to tie together here a little bit is what went here earlier. And that is, if you're back here in chapter 10, verse 8, it says, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. This is your first tyrant. It's very interesting to discover that the world at one time, at this time, was unified under a single government. And that single government was totalitarian, and it was Nimrod. And incidentally, he was a son of Cush, so uh, you know some people love to make the point that he was probably a black man. I don't know if Cush was black, but they liked to, you know, for those, that, that goes over big in the South to point that out. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, this translation is unfortunate because what's implied by the language is that he was a mighty man. He was a hunter, probably of men, and um, he was defiant before the Lord. The name Nimrod itself means the rebel. The rebel. Now, what you really, what helps put this in perspective is to recognize the lessons we learned from Revelation 12 as we looked at Genesis 3 and what Satan's trying to do. What's Satan up to? Satan is the great imitator. And what Satan is doing here is establishing right up front his leader. And it's very, very interesting to draw parallels between what Satan's trying to do at the end time versus what the Lord has ordained. We find in Zechariah the whole idea that God will put a mark on the foreheads of his own and seal them. And yet, of course, in Revelation 13, we find the man of sin, the Antichrist, the lawless one. The lawless one's an interesting title, especially when you look at Nimrod's title as being the rebel. Um, you can just make a list of parallels and, and, and see it all the way through. Now, what, what Nimrod is doing, it says hit the beginning of his kingdom was where? In Babel. Now, Babel actually... Uh, Babalu is really the the Babylonian word from which it comes, really means the gate of God. It also can mean the tower of God. Babel, in the sense of confusion, is a word we derive from the historic event that occurs later. But the intent was to uh, uh, the gate of God. 
we get very interested in uh, Babel, the Tower of Babel, as the beginning of Babylon, which is the source of all idolatry. The reason we get interested in that is because of its prominent role throughout the Old Testament, but even more important, it, it's paramount importance to you and I. Because we can't really understand Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18 unless we have some feeling for what it is that John is talking about when he speaks of mystery Babylon. Babylon the Great. The mother of what? Harlots. That doesn't mean she's a harlot. Doesn't mean she's the greatest harlot that ever was there. The worst idolat idolatrous system that we've ever seen. It means she's the mother of all harlots. Now, you and I, in our biblical perspectives, tend to be sensitive to the fact, I'm sure, that idolatry is what God hates, that idolatry is an abomination before the Lord. We've also become sensitive to the, the use of language, the parallel use of language with fornication and adultery versus false worship. We, we, we have Israel spoken of as the unfaithful wife of Jehovah, right? Widowed and divorced. In a spiritual sense, she's spoken of as widowed and divorced, strangely enough, by Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah. It's a strange language. But this whole parallel between the faithfulness of a woman and her unfaithfulness, say to a man, and the faithfulness or unfaithfulness of Israel with respect to the Lord. And the same language, the idea of fornication, you and I think of a, sexually, uh, a sexual uh, unfaithfulness. The Lord uses that word to speak of spiritual unfaithfulness. We speak of uh, adultery in terms of uh, the failure to honor a commitment in a relationship. And God used that same word to speak uh, toward the failure to keep a commitment to him. So what's interesting as we get sensitive to the use of language by the prophets, we not only become sensitive to the abhorrence that God has for, for idolatry, but we also get used to this, this, this use of language in sexual terms. Those, those terms that would speak of sexual sins, God uses to speak of spiritual sins. And indeed, uh, his whole ordination of marriage is a very special supernatural union that he has purposes for quite apart from the purposes that we think of. I mean, far, far beyond what we normally think of. In any case, what's interesting, as we look in Revelation chapter 17, 17 18, we have, we're confronted with this very peculiar creature called Mystery Babylon. And she's a very prominent woman in the book of Revelation. There are three women in the book of Revelation. There is the woman of chapter 12. We studied her before. Israel, right? Brings forth the man-child. There's also the woman of chapter 17, 18, this mystery battle the harlot, clothed in purple, right? And drink, drunk on the blood of prophets. And so forth. And we have a third woman. Who's the third woman? A virgin bride. Who is that? The church. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, the concepts of Israel and the church do become uh, focused together in, uh, in, uh, in the bride of Christ and the New Jerusalem and so forth. Now, the point is, Babel, Mystery Babylon, most you know, Protestant commentators have had a field day because there's all, the Church of Thyatira and the Mystery Babylon do have such papal overtones that the, you know, the, the Protestant commentators over some centuries have had a field day with that, but that's an oversimplification. Because what Mystery Babylon is all about is not the church at Rome. Mystery Babylon goes long before the church, Ro church at Rome existed. But Mystery Babylon starts here in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, with Nimrod the hunter. And the reason we're interested in this guy and what happened, even though our hints here are very vague and very shadow in the beginning, is because that plants the roots for some things that um, become uh, major themes throughout the scripture. Um, I can't resist pointing out some other subtle things. It's fascinating to me as we try to grapple with what Mystery Babylon is really all about is that she makes some very interesting boasts. Well, first, the first point I want to close on, because I, I started and I may not have finished. Mystery Babylon is the mother of all harlots. Remember? Revelation. And that says that she is the source of all false religious systems. We tend to think, I think, that religious systems get created by Satan as just deviations from the truth, ways of, of, of jamming the channel, creating noise or confusion. And indeed, he does that. 
But there's a mystical sense in which all those false occultic doctrines have a common root, a common root. And that's in what was known later as Babylon, but had its roots at Babel. Now, maybe it would be useful to talk about that a little bit to, before we jump into what the Tower of Babel was all about. Um, Nimrod had a wife, Semirabbas, who was worshipped as the Queen of Heaven. And the concept of a Queen of Heaven is carried through the ancient and modern idolatrous systems. Call her Diana of Ephesians, Aphrodite. She goes by many different names as to whether you're talking Greeks, Romans, or what have you. The Egyptians had a name, the Greeks had a name, the Romans had a name, but they all have the same source. They all go back to Nimrod's wife. And they had a son. His name is Tammuz. The first letter of his name was a cross. Isn't that interesting? And um, he was also uh, worshipped, in effect, as the sun god. And the sun died about the time of the winter solstice. You all know how the days get shorter in the winter? About 20, December 22nd or 23rd, we have what we call the winter solstice. The days are the shortest, the nights are the longest. It's a result of the, the uh, canting of the Earth's axis relative to the sun. It's a normal astronomical event. But to people who are planting and have no accurate calendar and so forth, uh, this question of seasons is very crucial economically. So this whole, you, know, you and I sort of take a calendar for granted, but to the ancient cultures it was a big deal. And uh, understanding the summer solstice, the longest days, and the winter solstice, the shortest days, was a big deal. And this all got all tied up to this uh, occultic system where the sun god was regarded as having died on the winter solstice. And then as a few days went by and they saw the days getting longer, he was considered to be reborn again. And the way they used to, wor the way they used to worship in Babylon that idea was to take a, a log, a piece of a living thing, a tree, take a log, and they would burn it, a sort of an offering, commemorating the death of the sun god. This, this uh, log was symbolically an infant. The Chaldean word for infant is Yule. And they used to burn it one night, and then the following day they would have a tree replace the log, commemorating his resurrection. And they used to trim this tree. And about the time you're ready to celebrate Christmas, read Jeremiah chapter 10, and that'll put you on a guilt trip. It sounds like he's talking about a Christmas tree. He actually isn't. He's talking about another thing altogether, but it's kind of fun to lay that on, on people. And, uh, and I'll find some excuse to get in Jeremiah 10 as we get into late November. Uh, but the point is, uh, the idea of fertility, the mistletoe, the concept of the wassail bowl, the concept of, um, obviously, Christmas trees, yule logs, etc., uh, all those ideas did not start with the Christian church. They started with ba at Babylon. And uh, in the Babylonian system that grew up in the 6th century before Christ, uh, and they got conquered by the Medes and the Persians, right? And uh, then the Greeks. And, and the, the, the Babylonian system moved to Pergamos. And that's why in the letter seven, letter seven churches, we could speak of Pergamos as the, 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 where Satan's throne was. And then, of course, as the Romans conquered all of that, the Romans moved the system to Rome, and it became the the Roman system, and uh, what we call what we think of as pagan Rome. All the this whole system of multiple gods and all the all the uh, ceremonial accoutrements to that form of worship. And of course, when in the in 312 uh, A.D., when uh, Constantine was quote converted close quote, I won't get into that here tonight. Um, it became a very shrewd political maneuver. In any case. Uh, he, uh, the Roman uh, system suddenly became what was previously an underground secret sect hiding in caves became not only legitimate, became announced as a state religion. And so the rags of, of people hiding in caves were exchanged for the silks of the court, and the Christian thing was a big deal. And so obviously you have a culture of thousands of people that are used to celebrating roughly the 25th of December, uh, Saturnalia or Bacchanalia, you name it, whatever. They, they started adapting these Set these holidays to the Christian theme. And that's why you have Christmas on December 25th. You know it wasn't Christ's birthday. He couldn't have been born in the winter. No Roman administrator worth his salt would have half the world move when the most of the world was impassable. Um, and, uh, and so forth. The shepherds were in their flocks by night, which you don't do after October. So we don't know when Christ was born in terms of time of the year, but we know it wasn't in the winter. Um, 
So why do we so why do we why do we uh, worship uh, in effect Christmas or observe Christmas as a birthday of Jesus Christ on December 25th? The real answer to that, strangely enough, tracks back to Nimrod. Isn't that interesting. And we could go on like this, but there's some more important things to get at. This Tower of Babel, you know, if you read this naively, it sounds like they're going to build a tower to go up to heaven. And that is not. It's a tower. It's 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 a tower in defiance of heaven. It's a tower that is is uh, basically a religious monument. Some scholars believe the tower was high as to be a refuge in case of another flood. I think other scholars feel it's a little naive, but it's an interesting idea. I throw it out for for your view on that. Um, four times in the scripture, by the way, Nimrod is spoken of as the mighty one. Three times here, and then also in First Chronicles one. Um, the word in the Hebrew is actually Gabor, which means the chief or chieftain. And he is a hunter, and, and uh, we could go to Psalm 5, 6, but we're running short of time. Um, the Antichrist, is, you can draw a great parallel of things uh, between him and the Antichrist, being a king, having his headquarters in Babylon. Uh, the Antichrist is spoken of the king of Babylon, as the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14. And, of course, uh, in Revelation 17, we have mystery Babylon, which I've mentioned. The whole issue here is one to make a name these people are going to make a name for themselves. And um, it's also interesting that all of this springs out of Nimrod, who was under Cush and the subject of the curse. Subject of the curse. The curse that uh, was mentioned earlier. Now, uh, and also, it's lest we be scattered. See, this is in defiance of the law that God had laid down for them to go and spread out and multiply and replenish the earth. It's, the, it's an attempt to defy that. It's also interesting, uh, I can't leave this without commenting, that it, 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 many scholars, and I'm, I'm attracted to this line of reasoning, make from this whole scene a case for a case against a universal totalitarian government. They, uh, man is imperfect. If man was perfect, government could be perfect. But as, as man is imperfect, then what, you really, what, you, what, what really appears to be sound is to protect man from government. And this whole, this strangely enough, is a defense of nationalism as an imperfect but better way to go because there's a light, more higher likelihood of the defense of, of uh, the defense of in, in individual liberty and therefore the freedom of worship. And um, some of these ideas that uh, we really regard as maybe very po political and very provincial in terms of the last couple of hundred years of our history may have much deeper roots. In fact, that may have given the vitality to our first 200 years. Um, but this whole idea of a universal totalitarian system that is here being established and here being destroyed by the Lord uh, is not uh, is not his is not not a practical way of human government. It's interesting because that's exactly what men today, some of the intelligentsia uh, in the world today, be it the Club of Rome in Europe or be it uh, the Trilateral Commission in the U.S. or other groups, that out of genuine passions of their own, but naivete from a theological point of view, are committed to a one-world government. And uh, some of the, the some of the major forces in America today take for granted as just a given that the planet Earth will be under a single administration within 30 years, and that the challenge before mankind is to get there nonviolently. And uh, that's scary. Uh, I'm an Naval Academy type, and when I went to school, they used to call that treason, because that kind of an idea means that the leadership uh, spouses those ideas would prostitute the interests of the United States for that kind of a goal, and that scares me. But that's an aside. Maybe it isn't too much of an aside because that's really probably what Babel's all about. Babel is about something else, too, in the time that we have. Um, turn to Job 38. I'll introduce you to a word you may not have run into before. You might start verse 31. Job 38 is an incredible, incredible uh, verse. A pass a chapter, but 31 says, Canst thou bind? God is speaking here, and he says, Can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? Now, you all know the Pleiades, the seven sisters. What you may not know is it's probably uh, it's somewhere in this constellation of Pleiades, is the center of the galaxy around which the entire uh, galaxy revolves, which is kind of interesting. I don't know how Job realized that, but anyway, or I should say, the writer of the book of Job, except the Lord told him. Or loose the bands of Orion. Canst thou bring forth the Maseroth in its season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus and his sons? Now, all these are astronomical names. Pleiades, Orion, Arcturus are all names. You may, may not be familiar with intimately, but you probably recognize them as names of stars or constellations. 
What is the Maseroth? Anyone know? It is the Hebrew name for what you might mistakenly identify, or I shouldn't say mistakenly, it's, it's very close to this concept of the Zodiac. Now, you and I tend to regard, what we know about astronomy comes from an astrological tradition. Now, there you, I want to draw a distinction here between astronomy, which is a legitimate scientific study of the stars, in terms of how big they are, how far they are, and trying to learn, as a scientist would, all he can about the astrophysical behavior of our universe. In contrast to astrology, which is an occultic practice attempting to forecast the future, plus a lot of other things, from the pattern of the stars in the heavens. And from astrology, because it has cultural traditions that we're victims of, many of the names, though you know the names of the constellations by their astrological traditions, and those labels, being arbitrary labels as far as an astronomer is concerned, are useful for cataloging stars, recording them in ephemeris, in an ephemeris to point a telescope or to navigate a ship or what have you. And those, probably many of you here, how many of you here do celestial navigation, either a boat or aircraft? Okay, you're accurate. You do it in a boat. If you can't hold it to more than a degree, you do it aviation. Uh, yeah, I won't ask you. I'm going to use you a nautical almanac versus a navigation almanac. But anyway. Uh, those of you that are, are interested in that know that the labels you use come from an astrological tradition. Uh, but I want to draw that distinction. Uh, the zodiac is a the apparent path of the sun through the sky throughout a year, and it passes through groups of stars that have labels, and these labels that we know them by, we know them by their secular, and I might add, astrological traditions. And to be interested in that in no way necessarily identifies you as an astrologer. It says it's just a convenient set of secular labels so that we can talk about a particular air, place in the celestial heavens. Now, what's interesting, though, is that in Job 38, we have a reference made to the Maseroth, which is the Hebrew word for the zodiac, that is, that is 12 signs that the sun apparently passes through throughout the year. And you recall from Genesis 1, I know you all remember from Genesis 1, verses 14 and 15, where the Lord God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven that divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. Signs. Oh, that's interesting. And, of course, for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the firmament of heaven to give light in the earth. And it was so. Now, that's kind of interesting. You might turn, you could turn to Isaiah 40, 26. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. 25, to whom then will I will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, who bringeth out their host by number, and does what? And calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for he is strong in power, and none faileth. And that's an interesting verse. Those of you that are concordances can run with that and discover that God has names for all the stars. The question is, do you think he calls these stars by the same names? We know he calls Orion and Arcturus by those names because that's the way they are, right? And the Pleiades. Some of these others may have different names. Now, just uh, while we're on this little excursion, it might be kind of fun to pick up one more. There's dozens of these, but just to give you the flavor, let's turn to Psalm 19. We looked at Psalm 19 before incident to uh, the sun when we were in Genesis and the creation, right? But I want to call your attention to the first verse again. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, and so forth. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. Where does the sun go throughout the heavens? through what we call the Zodiac, what the Hebrews call the Maseroth. We know that the gospel was preached unto Abraham 400 years before Moses. What are, what are all we talking about? Well, if we go to, when we get to Genesis 49, you're going to discover that Jacob taught, gives prophecies to the 12 tribes. And you can infer from that the 12 tribes associate with each of the 12 signs of what we call the Zodiac. Numbers 23 and 24 also have the signs of the Maseroth. And in fact, the prophecy of Balaam, just to give you another little fun, let's just turn to Numbers 24:17. Numbers uh, 17, 24, excuse me, Numbers 24, verse 17, is a very, very, we all know ba this, this interesting, fascinating character called Balaam. We know him about the bad news, but he did give some prophecies, and some of his one of his prophecies is a very, very famous prophecy. 
the Christmas star in Bethlehem, some people feel. Verse 17, he gives his messianic prophecy here. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and he shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be his possession, and so forth. Very interesting prophecy by Balaam. What's a star out of Jacob? Some people make reference to this verse as a star of Bethlehem, and that may or may not be right. I'll leave that to your own independent study. But let's talk a little bit further about if I have the time, and it's probably fortunate that I don't, because it may be just a whole different scenario for you, but let me mention a few things to you. The signs of the zodiac, and I'll use that term only because it's more convenient to you and I, I should say Maseroth, I presume, has a number of signs. And we take them by a certain beginning, the first point in Aries and so forth. And that comes from certain astronomical considerations, but there's other places to start. And there's a whole thing about where you start, but let me not get into all of that. Let me just point out to you one particular sign. You know there's a sign called Virgo? What is that? Terrific. You know what the, what the first magnitude, the brightest star in Virgo is called in its Hebrew name? Zera, which means the seed. In Isaiah, Ahab, Ahaz, you know, ask a sign, ask a sign of the Lord. I will not ask, nor will I tempt the Lord. Very well, the Lord shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Isn't that interesting? The second magnitude star in, that, uh, in, in Virgo is, is uh, called in the Hebrew tzemek, which means the branch. Okay, five times in Scripture is referred to as the branch. We've been through that, I think, together. And Shekemeta, which is a, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, which in Haggai 2.7 is desire, the desire of women and so forth. And you can go through the names of the stars in the Hebrew of those constellations and find, find out a lot of interesting things. Now, we could, if we had the time, go through. Maybe that would be a fun thing to do on some optional evening. We'll have evenings when we'll meet this fall when there may be, uh, may be con there's a convenient time to sort of take a parenthesis from the path of things and just take an evening and go through this between uh, and go through the signs as they occur in their Hebrew names and how they speak of the gospel of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. Now, about some of these, we know a great deal, and I've mentioned Virgo as just one because it's very, very close to it. Some of the others are a little more obscure. But, of course, you have the water bearers, and you have the... You can go through the whole thing, and it's very, very interesting in terms of, of um, a deliverer and uh, the whole gospel message. Now, there are some, and there are several books written on this, The Gospel and the Stars. There's two or three books with that or equivalent kinds of titles. You can get them at a Christian bookstore if you're interested in doing this, and it's a fun exercise in the summer, especially if you're going up at camp, to take a book like that, read about it, and look at the stars, and learn the constellations by their Hebrew names, and be able to recount the gospel of Jesus Christ by the Maseroth, by the 12 signs of the Zodiac. Now, what some people believe some scholars believe is that God ordained his entire plan for the redemption of mankind, obviously before the foundations of the earth were laid. And they are chronicled in the heavens. And it was that was the mechanism by which he communicated to Abraham. We know the gospel was preached to Abraham before. Well, we don't know that because we're getting to that. It's going to be very exciting. I keep forgetting it. We really haven't looked at that. Uh, it's going to be very, very interesting how Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy when he offered his son Isaac. And his, the faith that saved him was his conviction that Isaac would be resurrected from the dead. We'll get into all that, Genesis 22. But the point is, is that God had ordained, the heavens declare the glory of God. And what we have established in Babel is a corruption of that system. The beginning of the twisting around and the perversion of those things which God had ordained to become the first source of idolatry, the first establishment of man as, as the one not only to rule in a governmental sense, but to be worshipped, to make himself defiant, to enslave others. And, um, um, and we have what we later see from Babylon as the root of all the, idol uh, uh, of the satanic systems. Now, um, we do find, incidentally, just as some cultural aside, ziggurats in, ba in, uh, in Babylon today, even. They're 297 feet high. Etamenica... Maki is one of them, which means, incidentally, the building of the foundation platform for the heaven and the earth. still there. The word ziggurat comes from a word to mean to be higher, to raise up. And what we really have instituted here is something that could have been an irreversible totalitarian state uh, um, worldwide. 
we have the mother of harlots, the queen of heaven ideas introduced. Um, and what God has done is he intervenes. And by the confusion of language, disperses the thing and breaks it up. And uh, it's very, very interesting to me to see um, the contrast of God intervening by introducing the confusion of tongues in Genesis 11 in contrast to his miracle of the giving of tongues in Pentecost in in Acts chapter 2. I think those are interesting antithetical or antiphonal ideas. Um, One last idea. I'd like to get two quick verses if I can still squeeze it in before I let you go. You might, just for fun, look at Genesis 26... Excuse me, Genesis 46. This is just something I wanted to close on with uh, this question of the, of, the, of the lesson tonight with all the different families. In uh, Genesis 46, and the son, verse 27, and the sons of Joseph who were born into him in Egypt were two souls. There's a list here of all the people that went into, into uh, Egypt from Canaan when they migrated there. And um, there were two souls, all the souls of the house of Jacob. Who, all who came into Egypt were three score and ten. How many is that? Seventy. If you t- paid attention in, in the lesson tonight, there were actually, if you count them, there are 70 families that are detailed that were selected. There are obviously more, but they were selected from the families of Noah. Why is that true? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. This is just a little tidbit that some of you can run with to see how fascinatingly the Lord just just moves. Nothing's by accident. I know I don't want 1022. I wanted that for something else. I'm going to skip now. Let's take 32, 7, and 8. In the interest of time, let's take a shortcut and let's just jump right into 32, 7, and 8. Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, where he says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Ask thy elders. And they will tell thee, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, and he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is with the people. I don't know what that means. I'll leave it to you to figure it out. But it's interesting that there's a relationship between the families that are ordained in Noah and uh, the sons of Noah in chapter 10 and 11 and, and this tied together with the children of Israel, with the 70 families, if you will, going into, or, or people going into uh, to Egypt. They're going to be delivered to that. We're, going to, we're, we're getting ahead of the story because that all happens seven years from now when we get to that part in, in, the, in, the, in the book of, of uh, Genesis. We have perhaps been a little uh, disruptive tonight charging through these, what, three chapters, 9, 10, and 11? Um, but I'm really, my intent was to get all the way to Terah and Abraham. Between now and the next time we meet, which will be two weeks from tonight, not next Monday, but the week following, we're going to undertake the study of Abraham. And we're going to, it is, uh, as you know, I'm really a prophecy nut. I'm fascinated with prophecy. But the most interesting prophecies I know in the scripture uh, will emerge out of our study of Abraham. Fascinating guy. And it starts with his family tree. And, and, and his failure to fully, his failure to obey God and yet why God records him as having obeyed. And why he, even though he failed to exercise his faith, as you and I might think of it, is recorded as the father of the faithful. And we're going to just get into this whole fascinating thing. What really happened in the first few verses of chapter 12? The call of Abraham. And um, and what and and, this, and his chronicle is one that will be uh, a lot of fun. I um, look forward to seeing you two weeks from tonight. Thank you. This concludes the tenth study in the book of Genesis.